Test, test. Hello. All right, thank you all for coming. We got another uh, uh, nine minutes of socializing, and Bree has said uh, she's going to be a little late because of rush hour traffic. Um, just so you know, we are live streaming. Uh, this is going to be recorded just like the last one um, so that we can put the lecture up on YouTube. Um, we'll try it. We, we, I think Kiln posts them unedited to their YouTube channel. So um, just so you know. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for coming. Please make sure you get name tags. Uh, and I think we got another eight minutes. Thank you. Oh, enjoy the do enjoy the pizza. Thank you.
All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, let's see, there's still pizza outside, so feel free to grab uh, a little more uh, if you need to. Um, Bree will probably be here in about 10 minutes. Uh, she's driving down from Orem right now. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. I am, there's a kiln representative in the building. I need to go grab them. I'll be back in a sec. All right, before we get started, uh, thanks to Kiln for uh, hosting us today. Uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to Cl Claire for a sec. Hi, guys. Uh, most of you have been here before, but this is Kiln. We're a co-working space. Um, everything from an individual person who wants to come in and use the space every once in a while to an office. Um, and we also host lovely events like this. Um, Wi-Fi is up there. Um, if you're interested in a tour, let me know. Also, a day pass. I have little day passes up at my desk. Um, and yeah, welcome. Thank you, Claire. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with introductions. Um, I'm just going to pass the mic around the room. Please introduce yourself um, and tell us what you do and tell us what your current vi current game project is. So. If you, ha if you have one. Yes, if you have one. Um, so I'm Thomas. Uh, I am a software engineer. I do uh, virtual reality and Unity prototypes and uh, cross-platform -plat ports. Uh, I also am my, um, sorry, my current project is uh, Hollowed Priest of the Forgotten God, which is a tabletop RPG adventure. It's only four pages long, and I just published it on uh, Itch today. Um, and uh, the cover looks amazing. My wife here helped draw it, and uh, I, pa I painted it. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic around real quick and introduce everybody. Hi, I'm Madeline. I'm married to him, and I do art. Uh, I've been doing art for video games for, uh, I mean, a few years if you can't game jams, but I'm doing art for a real, a real darn video game right now. So. That's pretty exciting. Uh, that's what I do, and that's my, well, the one I'm working on currently is called Art at the Duel of Faramore, so. Uh, I'm Jacob. I am a music and sound designer. Or I, I should say a composer and sound designer for games and other stuff. Um, I'm currently working with these two on the game there. I'll let them tell you about it. I'm Kobe. I do game development, programming, Unity, all that stuff. Uh, and yeah, we're working on a game called Arcane Audit. It's a Souls-like where you play as an IRS agent who has to arrest a wizard for tax fraud. Well, let's see, I have my Discord name, Human DLC. You can call me Human. Cause, and so I am uh, work cybersecurity by day, art for video games by night, and yeah, our game you can stab a wizard, so. <laughs> Wish list on Steam. <laughs> Hi, I'm Taylor. Um, yeah, I, I'm an electrical engineer by day <laughs> and aspiring game dev. So I'm working on a project uh, in Game Maker, if you've used that before, and uh, it's called The Hidden, the top down. Uh, roguelite, pretty fun, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> hey, my name's Garrett, um, I'm a software engineer, and I use Unity, I'm working on a multiplayer game, um, it, you could kind of say it's a cross between Overcooked and Bravely Default, um, it's kind of a JRPG, but built for your Built for co-op, so. Hey, I'm Joe. I am working with Taylor on his game. I'm working on the uh, music composition, some audio design. Hi, I'm Brienne. I'm presenting tonight. 
Um, I'm work I've been working on a solo game for about two years called Labyrinths of Elfane. It's a couch co-op tower defense game with a heavy focus on maze building. Um, and I've been building it in Godot. Hi, um, I'm Robbie. I'm a partner and I'm a graphics artist, so I like I think this is cool. Would love to get more into it. I just graduated. I <laughs> don't know what I'm doing. Hey, um <clears throat> all right. I'm Dallin. Um, I am a software engineer as well, and um, I currently am doing IT, though. But um, I am working on a Star Wars multi-shooter RPG thing, and I've uh, been doing that for a while. It's an open-source game, so you can download it right now. It's just called Jedi Knight Galaxy. Um, my name's Dylan. I'm a software developer by day. I mostly do web. Um, my current project is uh, in Unreal, and it doesn't have a title, and it's kind of an action-adventure Zelda-like. I'm Jason. I'm a keyboard monkey. Yes, keyboard monkey by day and night and midnight and all the time. Um, I'm making a game, Monster as Me. been working on it full-time, so, yeah. It's a cooperative game that is inspired heavily by Rampage. Right. I'm Eric Bridenstine. I'm trying to get into grad school, and I'm mostly here to help Jason with presenting the game. I'm Peter. I work at Taco Bell, and I've been working on games for like four years, but I still suck at it. And I don't know. I just kind of came here on a whim. Um, I, I use Pygame. It's pretty much it. Hey, uh, I'm Liam. I'm a recently graduated math student. Uh, I've been solo designing a game for the past couple of years. Um, I also do puzzle design, narrative design, and writing. So uh, if you need one of those, talk to me. Uh, and I've currently been write working on an Advance Wars ripoff. I've been writing in Rust for the past three or so years. I'm Jaren. I'm a technical animator, and I do Unity C Sharp stuff, too. And I'm working with a couple guys on a puzzle mobile game right now that we're trying to wrap up and then send out into the world. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to check on the streaming setup, and then we'll get started. Feel free to move my laptop. Cool. Oh, boy. Um, I did want to send the stream to a couple of people. It's currently private. Just ah. the, the um, if you could. I have a couple of friends who couldn't make it in person but still wanted to follow along, if that's OK. That is not my speaking notes. That is the book I'm writing. Uh, 
Oh boy. Just in case. I don't know what's going to pop up. Sorry, uh, where's the stream link at, Thomas? Okay. No, um, I was just opening Discord to send the link to someone and figured probably not best to broadcast my Discord to the entire world. Oh, it's mirrored. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, should we get started then? How much or time? Like half an hour. Well. Sure. Half an hour is plenty. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brianne. Um, this is my presentation on the lessons that I've learned um, working on the same game for about two years. Forgot to tighten this. Um, and specifically on maintaining long term motivation on solo projects. Um, this is a topic that comes up a lot online. And I didn't realize I could become an expert on it until I was watching a GDC talk and they were talking about all of the things that I had learned. And so I figured I would share all of the lessons I've learned here with my local community. So just to get started with who I am, um, like I said, my name is Brianne. I'm a former software engineer. Um, I've worked as a software engineer. I didn't necessarily love it as much as I thought I would. And so I've kind of taken an indefinite hiatus from that. I'm also a competitive fighting game player. If you go to any fighting game tournaments in Utah, you'll probably see me or some friends of mine there. And most importantly for this presentation, I'm the developer and creator of Labyrinths of Elfheim, which is a couch co-op tower defense game about building mazes. It has a demo, and all of you should download it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Here's a QR code, there's a link to it. I can also post a link in the Discord again. Um, but if you wanna see just kind of the results of my work in a playable, somewhat polished state that's continuously being improved upon, you can download it. Um, I like to follow the academic style of writing for presentations, where the first thing that I do is essentially define the domain of the problem. Um, I think it's kind of useless to describe a solution unless there's a decent understanding of what the problem actually is. So that's what I'm going to start with is defining the problem domain. Then I'm going to describe the solution um, in, these, in, in this order um, of building a good foundation, what tasks to prioritize, idle XP gain, externalization, playtesting and social interaction, and keeping track of your own mental well-being. So here is the problem domain. I want to give other people a way to recreate my happy childhood memories, TM, for themselves. I grew up playing a lot of Warcraft 3 custom maps, and Warcraft 3 is really starting to show its age. Like, development on that game started in like 98. I think that's when the first trailer for it released, and it came out in like 2001. So getting family together for LAN parties on Warcraft 3 gets harder and harder and harder every year. Um, so, I don't have enough money to hire other people to make a game to recreate my happy childhood memories. And the real world gets in the way sometimes where life happens. And so how is it that we can accomplish this first goal with these two things that are standing in the way of accomplishing that goal? 
And if I had to summarize it in a single sentence, it would be experiment heavily with your workflow organization and take care of yourself. However, um, no game and its success can be divorced from the process and the people that went into making that game. So this asterisk is, all of this worked for me, and we are not the same person, but I hope that by giving you enough context about why certain things worked for me, you're able to adopt certain pieces of advice that you'll find useful for yourself and leave behind the things that won't work for you because of the differences in our situation or the differences in who we are as people. So starting off with a good foundation. Um, Labyrinths was not the first game that I tried to make. I've been trying to make games since high school and every single one of them has failed. I've tried making a stealth survival platformer. I've tried making a co-op dungeon crawler. I've tried making a fighting game. That one failed the worst. Um, so what I looked up online was what is the commonality between all successful games? And where they, what all successful games have essentially is a design doc. It's very focused, it's very precise, it's very specific about what should go into the game and what should not go into the game. So if you are just getting started, a short, concise design doc lets you succeed quickly. If you describe a core gameplay loop, and build a game that is just that core gameplay loop, you have succeeded. Um, here is what the initial version of my design doc looked like. Um, it's collaborative maze building tower defense. Um, I specify that I'm gonna use hexagon tiles. Warcraft 3 uses a square grid system, which makes like corner navigation weird. And there's not a good way to have like a fully optimized maze because it is suboptimal at its most base level, so I wanted hexagon tiles. Um, and then there's a mechanic described down here of linking different mazes together that comes from the original Warcraft 3 map this is based on. Um, but I, however, that was left behind when I figured out it wasn't fun. So um, my other piece of success that I identified in myself is having a very visual design doc helps you occupy the perspective of the player and what the player is going to see when they like start playing the game. Um, if you aren't able to make a design doc that has visual components to it, that idea may need some more time in the oven for you to be successful with it. But if you can summarize it in just like a couple of short images, you're probably ready to get started on it. So the next thing in having a solid foundation is I knew how to program because I'd been working as a software engineer. I knew nothing about game development. So what I did is I searched online for a tutorial of make a tower defense in Godot, and I copied the tutorials from start to finish. It was like three hours of videos. And by the end of it, I had a game that worked. I could press the build button and send that build to people and they could play it, which was really nice to have like starting out. Um, like within a week of starting, I had a core gameplay loop. I had a lot of my core mechanics in place, a lot of core systems. And I always had this place of functionality that I could return to. I think one of the most demoralizing things about solo development is when you get to the point of you just want the game to work and it doesn't work for the first time, that is probably the time when most projects are going to fail, is if you can't make your game run once. So what I would recommend for having a good foundation is making a very small version of the game and then modifying that. It's a lot easier to modify something than to build something from scratch. So if you have like a sourdough starter, um, you know, if you have the right sourdough starter, it's much easier to have everything on top of that instead of trying to make like one giant sourdough at a time, if that makes sense. You know, you gotta have a seed, that grows into something. You can't just have a giant plant. Like it has to start from something. Um, and then growing on top of the foundation, um, something that you'll run into is, or something that I, I, I identified for myself as a place where I could have quit, but I'm glad I didn't, was when I outpaced um, YouTube tutorials and like very easy to digest like instructions on how to build the thing that I wanted to build. 
Um, once I outgrew that and I had to start digging into the engine documentation for Godot itself, I was very glad that I let myself like dig into the documentation and like learn how to read the documentation. So that that wasn't something that killed my motivation was like, I'm out of tutorials. The game doesn't exist yet as I want it to. Sucks to suck, I guess. Um, and then the last part of kind of growing on your foundation is a little note on programmer art. The less art that you have to make at the very beginning, the better in my opinion. Um, there's a website called Kenny.nl, which I'm sure, raise your hand if you're familiar with the website. Thumbs up if it's a good resource. Okay, Kenny.nl has fantastic placeholder art. It's high quality. It um, will often include like the original mesh data or the original SVGs for everything that is like pixel art. Um, an example of like how that really saved me a lot of time is I didn't know what tile size to pick. So I just downloaded the tiles from Kenny.nl. Everything fit around that tile size and that's what the game is built on top of. That saved me a ton of time. <laughs> So to summarize, just having a good solid foundation, start small and focused with templates and or high quality tutorials. We good? Does this make sense so far? Cool. So now when we have arrived at this hypothetical point of you have the first version of your game and it's not, you know, there's, it works, you have your core gameplay loop, but it's not your finalized game. How do you decide how to spend your time in between these two moments? What I learned is that motivation is your most precious fuel. Um, there's kind of like the iron triangle of like time, quality, and cost. In solo development, you know, most of the time what you have is time, not necessarily money. Um, and in order to utilize that time, you have to have motivation backing it. So how I maintained motivation was essentially always working on the things where the game mechanics emerged from that were very visible changes. Um, I recognize like I'm kind of in a lucky position of having lots of people who are willing to play test my game from roommates to members of the fighting game community and things like that, where if I have a very visual change and I sit that down in front of someone, they'll notice it and their excitement about that existing feeds me motivation and creates this really positive feedback loop. So, yeah. Um, other things in terms of like how I prioritize tasks is um, at the very beginning, I would make sure that at the end of a session of like working on the game, um, it would build and like compile correctly. Having a game broken for multiple days in a row kills your motivation. It, ruins it because you're, you know, the longer that a bug exists, you're losing mental context about like why that bug exists. You're losing mental context about um, like the solutions that you've tried. There's kind of a point of insanity where you're trying to do the same thing like multiple days in a row that's really, really demoralizing. So sometimes prioritizing a smaller problem is a great way to build your motivation back up to work on those bigger problems again. Um, another thing is just setting very small goals that I could accomplish quickly. Um, I've never necessarily had the goal of publishing my game. I've just had the goal of having a game to play with friends. Ultimately, like Labyrinths is a very social game. And by not setting this very lofty goal of publishing, but instead having the goal of playing my game with other people, I have a goal that I've been succeeding on for two years rather than like, I'm waiting years and years to succeed. I'm allowing myself to succeed by having a different measurement of success for myself. Um, so there's kind of just this engine that happens of, I have my motivation through effort. If I accomplish something, that feeds me additional motivation. And you can create this you know, perpetual flywheel for yourself. So be very cautious of putting in more effort than you have motivation for and make sure that you are, you know, you identify essentially the link between what you've accomplished and how it's feeding you motivation. 
um, and kind of introspect if that feels off at all. So instead of necessarily managing your project to accomplish something, try managing the order that you accomplish tasks or tickets on your project in the order that will give you the most motivation. This has worked way better for me than like, you know, I need to, to finish this thing. It's the most important thing. Um, next, I want to talk about something that I coined like idle XP game. Um, it's really exhausting to sit down in front of the editor all of the time and just spend all of your time like staring at the same thing that doesn't work for a long time. Um, so, oh dang it, that was supposed to animate, so it wasn't just all at once. Um, there's this very famous quote with a long and complicated attribution history, which is, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make all of them yourself. Um, something that I try really hard to intentionally do is not spend all of my learning time in the editor, learning engine tools or like learning engine components. I try really, really hard to broaden my horizons and make sure that I'm learning from the mistakes of other people. So GDC, if you're not like subscribed to GDC and you're not like constantly consuming GDC, consider as such, it is the premier industry event. The amount of knowledge that is just freely shared from GDC is incredibly valuable. Um, there's been a recent trend now that video games are becoming as old of a medium as they are, where senior industry members will start YouTube channels and talk about their experiences. So and my two favorites are Masahiro Sakurai, who's the series director of Super Smash Brothers, and Mark Dara, who's a former executive producer and narrative designer at BioWare. They both have like stylistically, these two are very, very different. Like Masahiro Sakurai is incredibly focused, incredibly precise. Every video has a specific message that he wants to get out before he even like sits down to film anything. Whereas Mark Dara will essentially just like do playthroughs of the Bioware games and be like, oh yeah, there's this lesson that I learned here. There's this thing that happened here. Um, another thing as far as like maximizing your time outside of the editor, I try really, really hard to consume a lot of games criticism and journalism. Um, at the top of that list, I would put GMTK, or Game Makers Toolkit. It's a YouTube channel that does like games journalism and games criticism from the perspective of game design. He has an excellent series of videos called Boss Keys, which is all about like, yeah, I'm seeing some nodding in the audience. <laughs> um, he has an excellent series called Boss Keys, which is all about how different games approach like having locks and keys to access like different parts of the game as you progress through them. Things like Hollow Knight, Zelda games, um, Metroid games, things like that. There are some fun video essayists like Rasputin. Um, Corey Gaming is a very fighting game focused one. Um, it'll change your life if you watch Corey Gaming videos. Um, and then last on this list are two British people. There's James Stephanie Sterling and Josh Strife Hayes. Um, Josh Strife Hayes does um, content surrounding MMOs, which is a genre that I haven't touched since elementary school. But I love listening to the way that he describes them because he has a background in education. And so he combines his educational background with like a genre that I've never touched before and like really opened my horizons about like the different ways that people other than me experience and enjoy video games. And then there's James Stephanie Sterling. She um, is a journalist with a really interesting past. She was essentially blackballed from the industry when she reported on Activision Blizzard's um, widespread misconduct. And so she has all of the training and former like industry connections of like a professional games journalist that has to live on the outside because she was blackballed due to high amounts of integrity. And so they have very interesting perspectives that I just have really expanded my worldview. And then just overall, seek out genre discussion, critique and discussion outside of your familiarity. Um, it's a great way to do the top thing of like learning from the mistakes of others. Like learning about the different mistakes that like unsuccessful MMOs have done, even though I don't care about the genre, has really helped me um, with my own projects. So, and perhaps nail into your like, psyche that productivity does not equal time spent in the editor. 
sometimes you do need time away from direct productivity in order to make progress. Sometimes like the missing key to the thing that you're working on is hearing about something completely different. So yeah. Next I want to talk about externalization. Um, I have this thing that me and my therapist called noise in my brain, which is where I just have like 10 different ideas all competing for attention and they all have value, they all have merit. There's something good about every single one of them. But by the presence of all 10 of them at the same time, they become a problem. So the way to fix noise, and from my experience, a lot of other creative people experience noise. The way you fix that problem is through externalization, writing down what those ideas are, interrogating those, idea, what they, those ideas, what they're trying to tell you, and things like that. So a trick that I learned at a writing conference when I was in like high school um, is the drawer of new shinies. It's how a lot of authors will stay focused on what they're working on, which is inevitably you'll be weeks or months deep into a project and you'll have this fantastic idea for this other project. You're like, oh my gosh, I should abandon all of this, work on the new shiny thing. The trick that I learned was to never actually work on the new shiny thing, but write down as much about it as you can without crossing the threshold into creating it. So how this works is um, every time I get a fun idea, I write it down. I never open the editor for them. At most, I'll make a mock-up in Blender if I can't get the idea to essentially like stop bothering me without making a mock-up of it. Um, and if the idea is longer than two paragraphs, it moves out of the gameideas.doc and it gets its own document. So an example is I had this fun idea for a platforming-focused MMO with more of a play model similar to like a Minecraft server or like Borderlands campaign co-op. And I had some fun ideas about it, but the thing is it just kept giving me like, you should have this thing, you should have this thing. And so it has its own document now describing the network architecture, describing different like puzzle things, describing how the class system would work, how the item system would work and things like that. I never opened the Godot editor for this, but by writing down all of these things, it has quieted the noise in my brain where I can focus on labyrinths and I know if I ever get to the point where I do want to work on this, I haven't lost anything. Because the, the reason the noise happens is because the ideas that you have will be afraid that they're forgotten. So if you write them down, your ideas lose the quality of being afraid of being forgotten. It just lets you like focus on everything else. Um, the other thing is I don't just work in Godot. I'm also writing a book that I'm about 16,000 words into, the one that I accidentally opened when I tried to open my speaking notes earlier. Um, and having different creative outlets essentially lets you exercise the different parts of your brain. Um, you know, if we use a gym analogy for exercise, if all you did was bicep curls every day, your body would hate you. <laughs> your biceps would stop getting stronger, you would start to develop repetitive stress injuries, and your body would hate you. But by doing bicep curls one day, tricep presses a different day, leg day a different day, it allows you to exercise different parts of your body and allow those parts of your body to heal and work themselves individually the way that they're supposed to. So and similarly, when I'm working on my book, I'll go, wow, this is a really new, shiny, fun idea for a different book. I have a different document for my new shiny fun book idea so that I can stay focused on my one book and my one game. Um, the other thing is externalization doesn't apply to just things outside of your main project. It'll apply to things inside of your main project too. So it doesn't necessarily matter what tool you use to organize all of the noise for your project as long as it works. Usually you need something though that is a little bit less stiff and less formatted than a Word document. So I use Trello with four-ish columns to organize essentially the noise in my brain about labyrinths. The first one are my ac active tickets. These are the things that I'm working on, I'm spending time in the editor on them, 
I'm making solid progress on them. I'm writing updates to myself. I have my active backlog, which are tickets where I need to research what needs to happen for them, whether I need an asset creation pipeline, whether I need to understand a tool the engine gives me a little bit more, whether I need to do like market research, those kind of things. I have my finished but may need touch up. Um, this is once an active ticket is finished, I'm not ready to archive it yet. Usually I'll need to do bug testing, balance testing, other things like that. So I don't want to, this is essentially like the last place that a ticket goes before an idea is ready to be forgotten because the idea is fully fleshed out in the game itself. And then I have my actual backlog. These are all of the tickets where I'm like, I have no idea when I'm going to work on these, but I'm writing them down so I don't forget them, and I can just keep all of my attention focused on the actual matters at hand. So the lesson I would kind of summarize all of this as is work with and not against your untamable creative energy. Sort of the great curse of having creativity is you're constantly having ideas, and by using the new shiny drawer trick, it allows you to continuously like let your creative energy come forward, but not be like a detriment to accomplishing your actual goals. Um, let's talk a little bit about playtesting. So playtest as much as possible as early as possible. Um, this is an ethos that is preached by all of the biggest successfulest game studios in the world. Um, Playtesting works a little bit differently for solo developers. And so something that you'll find is that you start to play your game the right way, where it's like if you run into a bug, you'll start to subconsciously like avoid that bug of just like, yeah, I know that bug exists. I need to go work on that other thing. And then you'll set your game down in front of someone else, and they do not have the context to care, and they'll cause a memory overflow. <laughs> Um, my favorite example of this is in my game, after you pick all of your characters, there's a button that you can press that loads in the game session itself and like sets up, you know, all the characters, all of the signals and all the connections between things. But if you press that button, it didn't make the button go away. So I had a friend where he was like, it's not working. And he just mashed the button on his controller over and over again until like my game that takes up like 80 megabytes of VRAM on a good day or on a bad day um, completely shut down the system that it was on because so many overlapping game sessions just spawned in all at the same time. So, but that was the thing where I was like, yeah, I know that I should only press the button once. Other people do not care. <laughs> um, if you have a Steam Deck, get this. Um, this is an incredible piece of free software. If you put your Steam Deck into developer mode, this is a tool that you can launch inside of Steam itself that will let you upload titles. If you need to build your title on the Steam Deck, you can do that through here. Um, if you need to take screenshots, if you need to record video, you can do all of that remotely from inside of this tool. Excuse me. This tool, it is invaluable. Um, it is as plug and play as the other day, I reworked a mechanic for one of my characters. I opened this up after like exporting a build. I pressed upload title and I took my Steam Deck to my roommate and I said, hey, I need you to play as Icarus and see if anything breaks. It was that easy. So get this. Um, it makes it easy to always have like an up-to-date build that you can carry with you. Um, literally like last night as I was like going to bed, I was like, oh yeah, I need to like upload a build so that when I take my Steam Deck to the meetup tomorrow, I have an up-to-date build. Super convenient. I have a friend who works at Bungie doing QA for Destiny 2. And when I showed this to him, he was like, yeah, that's basically what we have at Bungie. And it's free as long as you have a Steam Deck. Um, but going back to this idea of like playtesting as much as possible, the root causes of most of my, like my most egregious bugs were found by my friends. I have a document on my computer where I keep track of like the bugs that my friends have found. Every time I like fix a bug, I'll like take a screenshot and send it to my friend and be like, thank you for finding this for me. Um, like, I really, really appreciate it. This has been, I've been scratching my head about this for months and you sat down and you found it immediately. So another thing that I do as far as like playtesting, I have two wired controllers that I take with me almost everywhere. 
Because they're wired controllers, I don't have to worry about connectivity issues. I don't have to worry about charging them. I don't have to worry about a lot of things. They suck. They were like $10 at Smith's a few years ago, but they don't break. Um, however, there's a lucky coincidence with playing fighting games and the way that my game is set up, where I designed the layout of my game to work on a single Joy-Con, where you have a single analog input and six buttons. Coincidentally, when I'm going to fighting game tournaments, most people only have a controller with a single analog input and between six and eight buttons, which means anywhere that I take my, like, if I take my game to a fighting game tournament, people can just plug in their own controller and just play with me. And I can get very, very low effort feedback from people on controllers that they're familiar with. Another thing is fighting game players find exploits and broken mechanics very quickly. This is like one of those like asterisks, like I am me, not everyone is in the fighting game community. But um, there's a skill that you develop when you play fighting games where you look for the broken shit as quickly as possible. And it's a skill that you can develop over time. And so sometimes like I'll just set it down, like I'll give my game to a fighting game friend and they'll read through the descriptions of the towers and they're like, oh yeah, so if I do this, maximum damage. I'm like, you're correct. So anyway, um, if you're not in the fighting game community, it's probably worth like retaining the friendship of someone who is really good at video games to get that perspective in addition to just regular Joe Schmo, all of us. But kind of the, the core lesson of like playtesting and everything from here is keeping your game in a shareable state invites low effort collaboration. Um, a lot of the reasons that will become so, like people will become solo developers is because you can't get people to care to the, in the same quantities in the same ways that you can about your game for a long enough period of time. And so, because you know, if you don't have enough money to hire other people, you're relying on people's own intrinsic motivation to, um, you know, continue to feed them that forward. But if you keep your game in a shareable state and give it to other people, they can give you excellent playtesting feedback. They can hunt for bugs for you. They can find the solution, like the causes of your bugs for you. And it's a great way to distribute some of the like isolating work of doing solo game dev with other people. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is essentially your mental well-being. Because motivation can be a very fickle resource. It is more fickle if you don't have good mental well-being. So um, similar to like journaling, or sorry, similar to like the externalization that I talked about with like your drawer of new shinies, with keeping track of like your tickets and features and bugs and things like that. Um, if you also journal your thoughts when you can't focus, you can sometimes like get out your more personal feelings and then have like a clean mental working slate for your game. Um, another thing is to recognize burnout as a warning sign of mental injury. So the way that I talked about, like, if you only exercise doing bicep curls, you're going to get a repetitive stress injury. My theory is that burnout is essentially a mental repetitive stress injury. If you feel burnout coming on, you need to analyze that feeling, figure out where it's coming from, and make appropriate adjustments so that you don't more deeply injure yourself and, like, keep you from working on your own game. Go to therapy. Creation isn't therapy, therapy is therapy. Um, a lot of times I feel like creativity emerges from an exploration of dissonance, where it's either there's these two ideas that should be, or like feel like they should be separate, but I keep finding them like coming together, or there's these two ideas that should be opposed to each other that are overlapping in some ways. Therapy gives you the coping mechanisms and the skills to work through those things with like real problems. Whereas like creativity allows you to essentially explore dissonance rather than resolve it. Um, and yeah, if you're not taking care of yourself, motivation is a lot harder to find. And then kind of the last thing here is spend significant time away from your workstation with the people that you cherish. Um, <laughs> Even though when your game is finished, more people will probably know the title of your game than who you are as a person. Um, that immortality doesn't exist in your head in the same way. Um, 
I think the most precious thing that we have here on earth are the connections that we have with other people. And working on your game to the point of you know, becoming a detriment to like the relationships that you have with like the people most precious to you, I think is counterproductive to the joy of game development, essentially. And um, for example, for myself, when we hit the month of June and Street Fighter VI released, I took a full month break from working on Labyrinth. I was like, all I'm doing is playing Street Fighter VI with my friends. I'm never opening the Godot editor for the entire month of June. And I'm so glad that I did because like, that break gave me just like so much joy from spending the time with the people that I love and like giving myself that break made it where I just felt no shame about not working on my game at all. And the last thing is life is too short to be miserable. If working on your game isn't making you happy, if working on your game is making you miserable, introspect, analyze, figure out why that's the case and see if it's just you need to make an adjustment in how the game dev process is going, or if you need to make a different game, or if you need to just take a break from game dev. Um, so to summarize all of this, James Stephanie Sterling said this very famous quote, she repeats it in a lot of her videos about um, crunch culture and you know publisher abuse of employees and things like that, which is that no game or piece of art is ever worth anyone's sanity ever. This is true for your art that you create for yourself. It is not worth your sanity. Um, it should be something that makes you happy. So rather than ending on a downer though, I'll go ahead and summarize. Um, taking care of yourself makes everything easier. Build the core gameplay loop and modify that game. Spend time away from the editor to learn and recharge and make sure that making your game makes you happy. And that is my presentation on how I worked on the same game for two years. Um, I would love to answer questions. Yes. And I have had a lot of tough questions. Yeah. So I think the first thing that you can do, so, and to repeat the question for anyone who didn't hear it, how do you find playtesters? I think that, so yeah, the first thing is just like find spaces where people like playing games. Um, like a game dev meetup is a good one. Um, another one is like sometimes board game nights or co-working nights or things like that. Um, another thing is you have to be careful to not ask your friends too many times. Um, something that I try to like mentally keep track of is like how much the game has changed since like X person played it. And if the game has changed a significant amount since that one friend played it, um, I can explain like, yeah, there's this new mechanic, there's this new tower, there's this new character, there's a new map. Um, I can specify like all of those things. And so there's a reason for them to play test now. Um, another thing is like, I didn't want to say like have friends because that's not like a good piece of advice. <laughs> but yeah, if you have friends who play video games, that's usually the easiest place to find playtesters. I do recognize like being in the fighting game community and not only having like friends who like play games, but like competitively play games and like practice and practice and practice. Like that is a point of privilege where it's like I have a lot of people who love playing video games in my life. So. Um, did that answer your question, or did you have like something more specific from that? Okay. <laughs> the comment on that is you and your friends that played games and like that. Um, kids are a lot more willing to play the game over and over again. Like, especially if you keep being like, "Hey, like, if you play my game again and again, I'll give you five bucks." Why do you pay me to play a video game? The other thing is, so on the topic of like kids playing games, um, not only do they not have like the context of like, you know, where your bugs are and how to play around them, they have like negative context about how to like not break things. <laughs> um, so like kids are really good at breaking things. And so sometimes like, Oh shoot, what's, oh, software engineers help me. It's like destructive testing or like chaos testing. What's that called, that testing methodology? Where it's like, 
you basically just like have a testing suite that walks into the barber shop and says like fuck my shit up. <laughs> what's the what's the methodology term for that? I swear it's like chaos testing or something. Anyway, kids are chaos testers. They're like, I'm gonna press like button combinations you have never dreamed of, and you better hope that your input handler doesn't like just crap the bed. It is just chaos engineering. Okay. Um, there's like a fun fan theory that like in Dexter's laboratory, like Dee Dee, the reason he lets her like into the lab at all is for chaos testing. But, so it's like, it's like Dee Dee from Dexter's, yeah, anyway. Um, uh, other questions? I'm more than happy to keep going. What's up? I was just going to add a comment on that one. So like the problem is there are a lot of other Um, come talk to me afterward. There's something I'm not comfortable saying on stream, but I will talk to you about in person. Um, Okay, uh, other questions? Yes? What's all your four game things lined up? Uh huh. I feel like a lot of the time, like, I have like four game things in my mind, and it's like a pack of like all of the things. Mm -hmm. But I want to have that one simple guiding point. How do I decide what those things are going to do and what the stuff is going to do? This is just the same. I think that's a great question. So um, I'm going to answer it anecdotally. So the Freddie Mercury movie that came out a couple of years ago, um, starring Remy Malek, the way that they shot that movie was the massive, massive concert at the end was the first thing that they shot. Because if that scene in the movie didn't work, it wasn't worth making the rest of it. Um, so if you don't have like the climax of that movie, none of the drama, none of the buildup, none of the tension um, makes any sense to have. So how I would like answer that less anecdotally is if all you had was boxes in, in a 2 or 3D grid, what are the mechanics that those boxes would need without any fluff for the fun of your game to emerge? Um, one answer about that, like another anecdote about that, is the original version of Splatoon, which was made by Nintendo, literally just had like boxes that could detect like the color that, of the thing that they were on and change the color of the thing that they were on and chase each other around. And they figured out that like it was fun at that point and so it was worth putting in all of the extra effort of like art design and different types of weapons and things like that. So um, maybe see if you can condense a lot of different variations onto mechanic and work in one core representation of that mechanic. Um, so like in my case, my game originally only had one tower, one character, and one map. And now it has five characters with between three and four towers each with like complex mechanics of like giving buffs to adjacent towers, different types of projectiles that they can launch, different particle effects, different status effects, different other things like that. Um, the original version of my game was actually, like, the thing that I did to know that my game was going to be fun was I had a grid and a character that I could move around, around, and when I pressed a button, it would change that grid to either exist or not exist on the navigation mesh. This is back when I was using a nav mesh. And then I could press a different button and a tank would start at the beginning and try to walk to the end. And if I could change the path um, that the tank would take along the place, this might make more sense if you saw like the demo for the game. Um, but if I could like change the path and like dynamically change how the tank wanted to get to the end, then I knew my game was like worth making because that was fun. Another thing is I did kind of cheat with my core gameplay loop, where like tower defense games have a very like well defined like genre trope um, of like you build your towers, they attack things, through killing things you get money to make more towers. Um, where my game differs from that is the heavy focus on 
the players make the path um, exclusively with the towers that they place. So I know this was kind of meandering. I gave a lot of anecdotes, but do you feel like you have a better answer for your question? Yeah. Cool. Um, we'll go you and then you. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. I'm really big on four pillars for games. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that defines the game is not adding a lot of stuff. It's taking things away from the game. Yeah, that's another good way to put it. It's just like, what can you subtract until your game doesn't exist anymore? So yeah, uh, what were you gonna say? Their Mm -hmm. right? That could be your core game. It is the game that you can actually other mm -hmm. by modding it and doing those first things. And so I really like the presence of the game. Yeah. And that's a good way of starting out a game with the core and starting out a whole game. Yeah. yeah. It's funny you mention that. There's actually a point that I forgot to make during my presentation, which was by having a functional tower defense game that I was building on top of. The past two years have basically just felt like I'm modding a game. Technically, I'm modding my own game, but like, that's sort of the point I was trying to get to is like have a very, very small core thing that you can sit everything on top of, because building a mod is a lot easier than building a game. So try and make the game as small as possible. But yeah. Um, any other comments or questions or anything like that before we go into the demo portion of the evening? Any feedback on the presentation? <laughs> Is it very, was it bright and yellow and pink enough? Very good. Thank you. Hello. Okay, thank you, Bree. Uh, so they don't know what's going on with the lights. I don't know what's going on with the lights. Don't worry about it. So we still have leftover pizza here. Feel free to grab some. By the way, thank you all for being here. This is record attendance. We have never had 22 people come to this before. Good job. Thank you all for being part of that. Um, we're going to switch over to demos now. So for the next 40 minutes, we're going to be doing demos. Uh, any, anything you brought um, that you'd like to show off or have people test, uh, feel free to set it up here on the benches or out in the, out in the lobby. Um, I'm going to be, I already have dibs on the screen here. So uh, also, um, if you have any questions about game development or if you have a problem you run into, please feel free to ask around. Um, there's people who are happy to help you. If you can't fi if you find what you're looking for, please come talk to me. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, oh, also, by the way, pack up. Please start packing up by 7.50. We, want, we need to be out by 8. Thank you. <laughs>